This is the sixth and final of our fall lecture series. Uh, and I am extremely pleased to welcome uh, Lance Young and his team to talk about the tribes and their relations with Massachusetts Bay Colony. Lance Young is the chief of the Namaska Nation, the Wolf Clan. He is the ninth great grandson of Tispaquin and the Shawsquachem Amy, the daughter of Massasoit, who held a domain over the Namaska lands from a Wampsit, which is today Lakeville. Lance's line descends through his great grandmother, Lydia Tuspaquin, while the Namaskit people appear to have been lost to history after King, King Ch Philip's War. Tuspaquin and the Wamsey families have, over the many years of oral history, worked to keep their family link alive in the Namaskits. In the early 1980s, Lance's grandmother, the late Princess Sw Swiftwim, Swift Wind, Bernice Wamsey, received from Great Moose, the late Russell Gardner, who was a renowned Wampanoag historian, the authentication of their Lamasca lineage and their leadership. Since the passing of his grandmother, Lance has taken the leadership role and is working with the elected council and others to reestablish the presence of the Namaska nation. Lance is a graduate of Middlebury College and is currently the director of marketing for a technology consulting firm located in the Boston area. He is also a graduate of the Center for Creative Leadership and a certified facilitator of the Strengthening Families Program for Native Americans. He lives in Medford, Massachusetts, and I'm pronouncing the way that the Native Americans, the indigenous people would have pronounced the name. And I'm extremely pleased to welcome Lance and thank him for his efforts. Take it away, Lance. Thank you, John. Um, let me just put the uh, share screen up before I do introductions. Yep. So thank you, John, for that introduction. And we wanna thank the Partnership of Historic Boston's for giving us this opportunity to uh, be a part of your lecture series and to tell our story from an indigenous point of view. I'm honored to lead this discussion with all of you from my home in Medford on the land of the Massachusetts. I honor this land and space that I occupy as the place of the Massachusetts. May our words that we speak tonight empower and be truthful to the Massachusetts, to the Nipmunk, to the Namaskit, to the Pocasset, and to all the tribes in the region. With that, let me introduce my indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, first up is Ferris Gray. Hi, Ferris, if you can wave to the, to the audience. Ferris Strong Medicine Gray, the Sagamore war and War Chief of the Massachusetts Tribe of Punkapog. Along with being the Sagamore of, Mass of the Massachusetts Tribe at Punkapog, Ferry sits on the board of directors and is a tribal council member. He is one of the tribal historians. He is a tireless advocate for the tribe and for indigenous people across the region. He works to correct historical wrongs and is a fierce advocate against indigenous people, against the wrongs of indigenous people. Ferris will provide commentary on the Massachusetts tribe and will also add commentary in other places along the way. Next up is Cora Pierce. Hi, Cora. Cora is a proud member of the Pocasset Wampanoag in Fall River, Mass, and has been preserving land and ceremonial landscapes for nearly 20 years, weaving the land back to its people and people back to the ancestral territories is what brings her a great joy. She excels in indigenous historic preservation, particularly where it comes to land sites where you might see an ordinary outcropping of rocks or boulders. She recognizes it as an ancient historical ceremonial site, complete with indigenous etchings and hieroglyphics that go unnoticed to the naked eye. She works tirelessly to prevent the destruction of our sacred places, especially ceremonial sites and burial places. Cora will talk more about this later. And last but certainly not least is Brittany Wally from the Nipmuc Nation. Hi, Brittany. Brittany is the anti-mascot representative for the Nipmucs. And with other indigenous nations and allies, she works to end the harmful use of indigenous mascots. The Nipmuc Nation, along with all indigenous nations in this hemisphere, have long held the clear position against derogatory and harmful stereotypes of native people, including sports mascots in the media and in popular culture. 
Brittany is a member of the statewide Massachusetts mascot coalition, and she will speak more about this and why it is even more important today that we end this in the era of social justice. She will provide a narrative on the Nipmunks, and she has a degree in sociology and experience in education, ranging from being a historical interpreter and guest speaker to instructing in martial arts. Thank you. So let's begin. Um, I want to give you an agenda here um, of what we'll be speaking to tonight. Um, we'll talk a little bit about who we are, um, give a overview of our ancestral homelands from the concept of Algonquin speaking, and then we'll talk about the three nations that, um, that are represented here. The fourth nation being the Pocasset, which I will talk about relative to the Namaska, because there is an intercorrelation between those. And then we'll go into some relations with the colonies where there was cooperation, where there were differences, and then talk a little bit about the inevitability of war. We're gonna switch very quickly, fast forward to the 21st century. I know that's a lot to unpack, but we'll go into giving you an understanding of where we are today, um, what we're looking for in terms of acknowledgement and support. CORE will talk about historic preservation, and then Brittany will talk about mascots and imagery and, and what we're doing there. We're gonna end with a brief video about um, native lands that the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum did uh, for Indigenous People Day featuring Elizabeth Solomon. So let's get going. So who are we? We recognize that we are descendants of these people that were in the easternmost part of this land that for some people was called Turtle Island. North America, we reach back through our kinship to understand this thing that is place. This is the place to which we belong, just like the trees belong, the rocks belong, the ocean belongs. This is the place that we belong. And long before this was called North America or New England, this was the place of the Eastern indigenous people. Um, what were those people? So before I get into that, I want to talk a little bit about this idea of the, of the creation story. I talked about Turtle Island. This, among many, was a creation story, um, which many of our tribes or many of our nations had in common. Um, the English were first introduced to the idea of the great turtle in the early to the mid 16th centuries. And what that presumed was the idea that North America or the land that they had come to was actually sitting on the back of a great turtle. But the interesting thing about that concept is if you look at this satellite view that I'm projecting here now of North America, and you look where my pointer is, you can see an eye there. You can see the shape of what looks like a, a head and a mouth, and then the chin. And if you look down through here, you'll see the legs, what would be the tail coming out the back, and then the other leg, and then this landmass on top of it. It does resemble in some ways a turtle. So for our people, the knowledge that they had this idea that maybe this landmass looked like that was this incredible thing. But this immediately created a conflict with the uh, colonists and with the people who had arrived because it was in direct conflict with their idea of a creation story. The thought that any land or any mass could have been created by anything other than um, the God that they worshiped and the God that they knew was incomprehensible to them. So right there, we would have seen a situation in which there was an incompatible or in irreconcilable thought system between the two. I also would like to add that these creation stories that we're talking about, you know, obviously they're very different from any kind of colonial story. So there's an immediate conflict, but also that there are many different creation stories between different native tribes and even different bands within the tribes and even maybe between different families. So there really is quite a range of ways that you can speak as far as creation stories go and that only adds to the complication of this topic. Great, thanks Brittany. So let's talk a little bit about our ancestral homelands and this idea of Algonquin. Many times it's misperceived that we're called Algonquin nations. It's probably a better thing to say that we have, we all have Algonquin tongues. So there is an Algonquin nation, there is an Algonquin tribe, but when we look at the idea of Algonquin, we look at that idea that we are all linguistically linked by region. So there are three regions which have this linguistic link, the, the Eastern, 
um, Algonquin, the Central, and then the Plains Algonquin. Um, what they all share in common to some extent is this strong oral tradition that's based on stories, song, hieroglyphs, and symbols. And, and Cora will talk a little bit about those hieroglyphs and stuff when she talks about native landscapes. Um, but one of the big things that we all believed was the natural world was sacred, that everything in the world had a place, everything in the world had a purpose, and the world to us had this level of sacredness that we had a respect and an honor that we honored in many ways that was different than what the people who came over had in terms of what they believed the world for was for and how they would use the world. Another thing that we talk a great deal about, and I talked about that in my introduction, was this, this importance of land and the difference in the concept of that we were stewards of the land, that we had a respect for the land, and that we belonged to this thing that we call place. So the idea of place was very important to us. Um, the Eastern Algonquin tongues, which are this area here uh, in lighter pink, really talk about everything from the Abernaki and the Mi'kmaq to the Massachusetts, the Mattachesit, the Nipmonk, Poconoket, all of those things are what we would call the Eastern Algonquin tongues. And what, what made us uh, unique or brought us together is that we shared linguistic features between our neighbors. So there was an understanding between between the neighbors around you that you could understand them, even though, as Ferry says, sometimes it's like when you go from New England to um, to the South or to California, even though we all speak a certain uh, English, it's hard sometimes to understand the specific dialects. So we did have different dialects. We did have certain words that were unique to uh, to those nations, even the Massachusetts had different words that were unique to the Nipmuc, to the Poconoke, to the Namaskis. So we, we, we had a commonality, but we certainly had differences in how we expressed ourselves in our languages. The other thing is that we were largely agricultural nations. Um, the concept of animal husbandry was not something that in at least the Eastern Algonquin nations and perhaps throughout the, the country was something that we actually did. We shunned that for, for more game hunting, but only for the purposes of taking from the earth what we needed. So this is a concept that becomes very important as the colonists began to ask for land and to use our land in ways that we didn't use it. And one of those ways was animal husbandry. So going on, um, another important point, which was uh, uh, across the board, something that we f that was important to us was this idea of um, corn as a sacred food. Um, as many of you may or may not know, the global domestication of plants started around 8500 BC, and um, there were seven places that that happened in. Three of those places were actually in the Americas, and those were based on corn. The, the uh, Valley of Mexico, Mesoamerica, and Eastern North America. Um, corn was actually developed as a result of South American native women um, crossbreeding grasses as a food source. And, and what developed from that was this sacred food, which, which was called corn. Um, an interesting piece of corn, which, which will become um, a distinction between planting by indigenous people and planting that happened with the, with the colonists is that we mound planted everything. So the mound plant with the three sisters um, and that was corn, beans and squash. And the interesting exchange between those three is nitrogen, corn takes up a lot of nitrogen. Beans give off a lot of nitrogen. So there's a great relationship of give and take between the corn and the beans. And then the squash leaves um, cool the mounds and shade the mounds, especially in those times when there's drought that so that the, the other two plants can grow. So there's this relationship between the three of those plants that was unique in the way that we planted them. And that was the reason that we mound planted them. Um, the other important thing was that these three, um, these three crops, along with others, but these three crops certainly provided a complete protein, which allowed our nations to flourish greatly. So this is an important thing that, um, that, that became uh, a distinction between indigenous people and, and the Massachusetts Bay colonies and other colonies. The other thing that what is an important thing to note um, was that most of the people who came to North America, at least before um, the devastation of disease and plague, noted that most indigenous people, and most of our colonies, most of our nations and tribes were disease free. So the pre-contact or pre-colonial population of North America 
was around 100 to 150,000 people, give or take a few. And those estimates, as um, as Ferris is often um, telling me, is based on the fact that the counts that were done were mostly done of men and not necessarily based on women and children because women and children didn't have the same status um, in um, a European or an English society as they did within in the cultures of, of North America. So the Massachusetts tribe had about 12,000 um, strong at the point of contact um, in 1630. And again, that's based on men and, and English counts. Um, we were relatively disease free and that's because we practiced certain things that were not practiced by the English. We believed in herbal medicines and other rituals and there was a ritualistic bathing. So we bathed all the time, even in the winter time. Um, the, the colonists noted how indigenous people would go and bathe. There was a ritual sense of bathing, a ritual sense of cleaning. We did have a mostly plant based diet um, and that was supplemented by uh, wild fish. Uh, fowl game and shellfish. And shellfish is important because as you may or may not know, um, we used every part of that. So the shellfish, especially the wampum that came from the Quahogs, then became beads and jewelry and so forth and actually became the lingua franca in terms of the currency at the time when, when the English got here. Uh, we also took a great deal of time to practice ceremony and had recreational periods. And that was most to do with how we lived and how our, 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 our tribes and our nations were structured, which Ferris is gonna get into in a moment. So there was ample time for ceremony and there was ample time for us to have recreation, which we did enjoy quite a bit. Because of the way that we lived, because of the way we practiced medicine, because of the way that we ate and the way that we, we had recreation and so forth, there was little or no disease. And so we had little or no immunity to the diseases that came over um, when the English got here in 1620 and then in 1630. Um, and actually even before that, when the English got here at the Jamestown colony um, prior to that. So there was a devastation that happened in 1616 and thereabouts, some people believe it was hepatitis A that came over. And for most of the indigenous people um, in what is today New England and beyond, great numbers of our people were wiped out because they didn't have immunity to these diseases. From that point, I'd like to um, have Ferris talk about the uh, Massachusetts. So here's Hello, um, thank you, Lance. Um, it's an honor to be here. I'd like to say, like to say thank you to all the panelists and everyone that's joined to listen to our uh, panel discussion today. Um, <clears throat> talk, tell you about the Massachusetts and uh, who we were. Um, um, the, the Massachusetts means um, many from the hills near the water, um, and our our leaders were often passed down through the generations. And we were not limited to, to male leaders. A lot of our leaders were women. Uh, our leader of uh, my band was Chikatawa. He was the Sakam. Um, we didn't use the word chief. Chief is, is a European word. Our word here for um, the leader is Sakam. That's how it's pronounced, not Saint Jim, but Sakam. And uh, he was the leader. Um, as Lance said, our population um, by English counts you know, with 12,000, but the English were only counting men because the men were the threat. Uh, men were the warriors. Um, so that's all they really cared about is how many warriors were there because um, they had plans to come here. Um, we we're a, we we're a coastal people, um, a ocean people um, and a land people. Uh, we were cut off from the, the ocean pretty early on in the settlement. Um, and so that part of us was taken away and uh, we're still trying to get that back, actually. Uh, and the Shawmut Peninsula is important because that's where the Bay Colony first came. Um, um, that's where they were first given the, the right to, um, to establish a town or a village there by Squaw Sakum. Um, she was one of our female leaders. And without her, uh, the Bay Colony never would have succeeded. Now we were um, um, a matriarchal society. Um, our women um, were pretty much our foundation. Um, and that was exact opposite of what Europeans foundations were. Um, our women were, were valued and honored always. Um, 
And a lot of time, the men would counsel the women if they had um, into tribal issues. Um, they actually owned the, the planter fields and they were passed down um, sort of like our leadership was passed down to their, to their daughters and, and it just kept going until the English came. Uh, you know, we, we had a, a multi, multiple um, uh, crops. It wasn't just corns, beans, and squash. Um, we, had, we cultivated grapes, nuts, all kinds of beans, um, and even wild rice. So, you know, corns, beans, and squash, which we call the three sisters, were a gift from the three sisters. Um, that, that's what gets a lot of attention is, is the corn because corn has become the staple. I always say that that was the indigenous's gift to the world is corn because everyone uses corn for everything across the globe. Um, and so we were uh, agricultural people. Uh, when the English came here, they were amazed at uh, the vastness of the Massachusetts planting fields. And when the, that was part of the success of the Bay Colony, because when they came here, the, they, these fields were already there um, and the plagues had wiped out many of the indigenous. So the fields were just left unattended. So it wasn't like they had to clear new fields. The fields were already there. And so, and they were rich fields. They were very good for, for growing. And so the, the English, it wasn't like they came here and had to start clearing land. And they decided to just start planting. Um, and, and we did trap, but it's, it's, it's good to note that um, in our planted fields, it was devoid of all large game um, that would damage or eat the crops. It was only small, small game or small animals that were there. And, um, and we used hawks. Um, we had a great relationship with hawks. Um, and we used every, every indigenous home had a hawk. Um, and we use these hawks as rodent control, kind of like the way we use cats today. Um, and they would help us with our hunts. Um, and our, our, our bay, which we call um, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, um, our bay was rich with all kinds of shellfish, lobsters. And I mean, rich, 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 it was rich. The English couldn't believe the abundance of seafood that was so easy to catch, they were everywhere. And this whole land was like that. Uh, and our medicines were vast and um, virtually unknown to the English. And it served us well until the English came and brought new diseases. Um, and our, vi our villages were, were seasonal. Um, a lot of times, I could speak for my band, we had a lot of names and it was the same people. We were called them the Ponset, we were called them the, the Ponkapog. And it, it's just, it's where we were when the English saw us, depending on the season, um, we would move. And it was all based on our resources and food, where the abundance of food was. So during the summer months, we'd move to the coast and we'd fish and we'd wear, the men would. And the women and the children would attend the fields that were along the coast as well for the Massachusetts. And um, so we were a seasonal people. Um, and we moved with the seasons, depending on the food source. Um, and the men were responsible primarily for protection um, from other men. Um, so I guess without men, the women wouldn't need protection. Um, so th that was primarily the, the, the responsibility of the man. Uh, but we did have woman leaders, uh, woman warriors as well. Uh, the indigenous man is smart not to ever tell a, a woman what to do because you cannot. And that is, that is a, that was a European concept of being able to tell a woman what to do. So if a woman decided she wished to be a warrior, then she was a warrior. Um, and we had, we had these, these really, really beautiful quarries that we used to quarry all kinds of stones, rhyolite, um, quartz, um, all kinds of stones um, that we would trade. Um, and the quartz we, was used for ceremony. We would quarry that and um, a ceremonial kill or something was always killed with a quartz um, arrowhead or a quartz spear um, if it was a ceremonial kill. Um, and, you know, the men also um, were used for intertribal relations. And, and, and that's just because, you know, they had to deal with a lot of men. Um, but it's, it's kind of misleading because the women also would do that. Um, our women leaders, um, like Squasakum, um, she, she, would, um, she dealt beautifully with the Bay Colony. You can't talk about the Bay Colony uh, without talking about Squasakum. And she was the relations between 
the Bay Colony and um, in the Massachusetts. And she, it was, it was because of her that the Bay Colony was so successful. So uh, she needs to be honored for such things um, and, and honored because she was one of our women leaders. And the reason why we call her Squat Sockham uh, it's because she didn't want the English to know her real name. Um, she kept that close to her. And so she was just referred to as squaw. And I understand that um, the word squaw is offensive to some of the Western indigenous people, but that was part of our language. Uh, that was our language uh, for women. So um, I'm sure that when the English moved south, I mean, um, west, excuse me, they brought this word with them. You know, west, they had no idea what that word was, squaw perhaps. Um, and so they term that as a derogatory statement towards their women. But that is part of our language. And, um, and that's, that's why we use the word squaw. Um, so it's important to understand uh, who the Massachusetts were and the lives that we lived um, and, uh, and the conflicts and the challenges we had um, when the Bay Colony arrived. Um, there really wasn't a whole lot of peace because more English kept coming and uh, and they kept moving further and further inland. inland. So the Massachusetts kept put, being pushed back further and further inland. And um, this was really, um, this is really what, what destroyed the Massachusetts, what was left of the Massachusetts tribe is that uh, we call uh, our territory ground zero for the uh, English invasion or the settlement because everyone's coming into Boston. All the new settlers were coming into Boston. And so that's ground zero. So it's really remarkable that any of us survived, um, but we have survived. And uh, I'd like to add, uh, we, we survived because of our women. Our women were the ones that held the families together. Um, and so our women were extremely important, still are important to us. So that's very important to understand our relationship with our women and how they are always honored. Uh, I'd like to thank you for this time um, and hope that you have some questions for me uh, a little later on. And with that, I'd like to introduce Brittany. Um, she's from the Nipmuc Nation, a um, very good friend of mine. So Brittany, take it over. Hello, or Cha, that's hi in Nipmuc. And uh, I'm here just to talk quickly about this slide. Now, there are going to be some definite similarities between what Ferris is saying, um, but also a lot of differences, too. So some things to point out, of course, is that this is about Nipmuc or Nipamug, basically a place that is a freshwater fishing place. So that would describe the people that were occupying that area. And when you hear freshwater, of course, that means further inland. So not a coastal people, not by the ocean, unfortunately. <laughs> Um, so, of course, nippy in the language means water. So, again, just giving that context to give it a little bit more of an emphasis that this is a word that's describing where these people are. In the time period, if you ask someone, maybe in the 17th century, you know, what tribe are you from? No one's going to say Nipmuc, but today that is a very common word. That's the name of the tribe today. So, this area that is of fresh water, um, that's going to be present day Worcester and the surrounding areas, central Massachusetts, and the tops of the correlating sections of Connecticut and Rhode Island. So that area that you'll see, just the tippity tops of those two states. Um, when it comes to relations, we have neighbors of almost every tribe in Massachusetts, and of course, um, the Narragansett in Rhode Island, because they sit right next to each other, um, and also the Pequot in Connecticut. So that means that we have a lot of different relations with these surrounding sister tribes, and sometimes alliances, and sometimes um, loyalties to those tribes, depending on what point in history you wanted to talk about. So as far as how the tribe is organized, um, whether it be past or present, there's obviously different levels of the English word chief or sakam, and then there's different levels of that type of leadership as well. And that means that there might be a higher up chief that has different responsibilities from someone maybe a little bit um, lower on that scale who doesn't have as many responsibilities or different responsibilities. And when you're speaking about these types of leaders, this could absolutely be women and men together. Um, but speaking of being matriarchal, these chiefs do not have the 
all the power. They don't have the end all be all say all situation. This would be um, the power held by the clan mothers, if you will. So no decision is going to be made by a chief until it's passed through clan mothers. And so speaking on present day, um, there are Nipmuc chiefs that are, there's a woman, there's a man, we have our elders, we have, um, you know, we have our clan mothers as well. So this is something that has translated through the years all the way to present day. And um, you can go to the next slide. So I don't want to say too much and bog everyone down with a lot of the similarities, because again, this list is pretty much verbatim the last one. What I'd like to point out is that we do have these two sections where we have tasks that women were responsible for and tasks that men were responsible for. So if you could kind of use an umbrella term, all the tasks that women are taking care of are going to be life giving and life sustaining tasks and men would be doing life ending and life altering tasks. And some of these tasks are very clear cut. Uh, most, most of the time, men would go hunting. You're going to end a life, right? But that, that food that's being sourced is going to provide and sustain life. So the cleaning and maybe the making of clothes and you know preparing food, that necessarily would not be a man's job, but would be a woman's job. So it, it's very fluid in that sense where it's not it's not cut and dry. And sometimes it's a little bit hard to pinpoint what category a task falls into. And to go along with this theme of, you know, getting rid of this cut and dry border between what men would do and what women would do. Um, if you didn't fall into those two categories, that's okay as well. So you may have someone who you would think would be doing a man's role or would be doing a woman's role, but they might be doing the opposite or a little of both. And that was accepted and that would be totally normal. Nothing to take note of there in the time. Thank you, Brittany and, and Ferris, that was, that was great. Um, I'd like to talk now a little bit about the Poconoke people, which um, you can't talk about those without talking about the Namaskit and the Pocasset people and um, and Cora, uh, uh, Cora will probably have something to say here as well. Um, first of all, we have to look at the idea that this area here, which was sort of um, southeast of the Massachusetts nation and also the Nipmuc nation, was what was called the Poconocet lands, which included the Namaskit and the Pocasset. So Poconocet actually is a place, it's um, near what is called present day Mount Hope. Um, again, the same thing led by a Sakam or a Squaw Sakam. Um, the most famous one probably, which was the, the individual who was um, in charge when the Pilgrims landed um, and also when the Massachusetts Bay Colony was landed, you know him as Massasoit. Um, his name was actually Osamican. Massasoit is actually a title. Um, it's actually not his name, but it's sort of the name that has been widely accepted at, as who he was. So um, again, the same population as the Massachusetts nation. There was about 12,000 based on those English counts. And these were coastal villages down here in what is uh, Fall River, New Bedford, Mount Hope, and, and all the way around to uh, Cushnet and so forth. Um, these tribes were bound together at that point by hereditary bloodlines. So um, in Pocasset and in Namaskit, there was an intermarriage or marriage between the sons of Osimikin. So at the at the Pocasset level, that was Wamseta, who was known as Alexander, um, and um, Tispaspin was married to uh, Amy, who was Mass who was the Massasoit or Osimikin's daughter. Two things that I want to to make a uh, a point of very clearly is that it wasn't actually the Pocan, it wasn't actually Osamican that actually met the pilgrims when they actually arrived. It was actually Samoset, who was an Abernaki. And it was later than um, Squantum, who was a Patuxet, who actually originally met um, the, the, the pilgrims when they, when they actually landed. And I know we're talking about the Massachusetts Bay Colony, but at some level you can't talk about um, about what happened there unless you talk about the these three tribes the other thing that i want to make clear is that although the world generally re uh, calls the people of this area the poconoket the namaskit and the pacasset wampanoag 
that actually is a misleading term because up until the time of King Philip's War, that word was not in the lexicon. So the word that was actually in the lexicon was it was Massasoit was at Poconoket, uh, Tespasquin was at Namaskit, and Corbinet or Wheatum, Wheatum, et cetera, was at, at Pacasset. So there's a thought that um, there is a thought that when King Philip went to create his uh, his coalition against the English, he called that coalition the Wampanoag, and that name sort of stuck after the after the uh, the uh, the war was over. So if you look at this from this point, this is really the 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 realm of Massasoit. Um, this is the realm of the Namaskit and the in the realm of the Pacasset. And Cora, do you want to add anything to that in terms of who these people were? Sure, I, I think that most people are always, um, you know, kind of hung up on Massasoit and and Alexander being Wamsetta and and King Philip, but we have to remember that they were a separate uh, band, and they what Massasoit had was he had two sons that married. Corbinant's two daughters, Wiedemo, uh, or Wiedemu, and her sister Wutunuski. Uh, we never hear about Wutunuski, and yet she was married to King Philip. Um, the Reverend Leroy Perry, who had been uh, the chief sachem of all of the Wampanoags in uh, 1925 uh, until he passed away in the 50s, uh, his his daughter and his correspondence to his daughter, Kathitha, whose name means uh, center of the heart is sweetest, was that Huidemu, Huidemu was the keeper of the fire in the lodge. Um, and her sister, Wutunuski, was the star of her people. And so I always want to remind people that, you know, though everyone sees Huidemu as a warrior, um, her sister had, had many... Um, of her own uh, toils that she she was able to marvel, but she was the one that her 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 tribe turned to. She was with them in the great uh, Pacasset Swamp um, fight, and when during they during um, the roundup, so to speak, uh, when Philip and Huidemu, um escaped up the Maori Path um, to go up to the Blackstone River and up the Connecticut River, um, they left behind. Um, not only uh, Philip's wife and, and son, but Huidemu's sister and nephew, um, who were then put on uh, the ass in, in, uh, in Dartmouth um, at Aponagansett, uh, there's uh, an island, and that was where they were kept until they could decide what to do with them. Um, and there's many folk tales that go with that. But one of the things that I do want to point out, because it, people always forget, is that at Mount Hope, um, where there's a large white quartz outcropping, where, it, where many people say that that is uh, King Philip's seat, you had a perfect view of what now, if you were to glance across um, the Mount Hope Bay, uh, was the Quickishan River it fell 137 feet in their waterfall. It's now buried um, in way too many um, culverts um, and but and underneath the Braga Bridge. But at one time they expected to, they could see rainbows from, from the Mount Hope. And so that was how we were woven to, to the land and to each other because um, the creator would often, you know, give us beautiful uh, sunrises, sunsets, and of course the, the rainbows from the Quickishan um, falling into the Mount Hope. So I guess that's what I'd want to say about the Picasset people and uh, until we get to the land. Thank you, I appreciate that, Cora, thank you. So moving on, again, this slide looks just like the, the last two slides that uh, of the Nipmunk and of the Massachusetts. And I, again, the one thing that I wanna point out here is that we were all matriarchal people. So, you know, this whole thing about the women's movement that's happening today happened with our people hundreds and hundreds of years ago where we, where we had a level of respect and honor for women and a level of pride and a level of, uh, of endearingness that they were not subjugated to us 
you can see already with this sort of way of how women had this level of power, how that would have been egregious to the Massachusetts Bay Colony, absolutely egregious to them. And the last thing that I want to mention about this whole thing is that this was a collaborative network of indigenous relationships. There were no poor people in our communities. No, pe no one went without. We all shared with the bounties and the riches that each of our nations brought to ourselves. We all gave in, we, had, we all had gifts, we all had things to give, we all had things to do, and everybody shared together. So you wouldn't have found homeless people or poor people, or even though there was this hierarchy where there were, there were, there were sockums and there were squa sockums and there were different levels of those, those were not levels that automatically assumed uh, a level of, of, of hierarchy like the English or the European kings and queens and the aristocracy and so forth, so that there were classes of people and you were put into a class and if you were poor, you were shunned. So we just didn't have that, that concept in our lexicon or in the beingness of who we were. Everybody shared equally. And if you were tending land, then you were expected to share that with the, with the nation. If you were trapping game, if you were protecting, you were expected to protect everybody. So that is a fundamental difference that, that as the colonists spread and things pushed deeper and deeper into our territory became irreconcilable as well as, as to how, how people were treated. So um, let's talk a little bit about the relationships with the colony or with the colonies, if you will. And we left this slide black for a minute um, because this is a real struggle for us when we look at um, the relationships there where there, were, where there were some relationships that were positive and, and negative and most of the relationships were ne negative. This comment, this, 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 oh, let me go back there for a second, sorry. Um, this idea that the King of England gave this colony permission to establish a colony in New England as though there weren't people there. It's such an egregious thought that there was no thought about the people who were already there, that they had the right from this king to do that. And as Brittany will point out many times, Plymouth had no charter. These were sort of people who just came over and said, hey, we're gonna plant ourselves here and we're gonna be here. And one thing that we cannot forget when we talk about this is that the Jamestown colony predated both Plymouth and the Massachusetts Bay colony in terms of uh, people from, from Europe and from England coming over and trying to establish themselves in the new world. So that's definitely something to look at. So this idea that someone gave someone permission to take land and create a colony in a place where there were hundreds of millions of people is, if you think about that today, is an egregious thought. Um, but anyway, let's talk about areas of, of cooperation. So, and there were a few areas of cooperation. Um, so this idea that these people who were not from this place, and I talked about the, the concept of how important place is to us, that we are of this place, just like the trees are and, and so forth, but came to stay. So this was an interesting concept because, you know, we had interactions with Europeans, even with the, you know, we had interactions as far back as the Vikings, there's records of our interactions with these people, but nobody ever came to stay. So they came to stay and what we initially did was welcome them. So there was initial welcome by us and we did provide them with land to use with the understanding that they were gonna be caretakers of that land, not necessarily that they were gonna own that land and put it into private ownership because we had no concept of that type of thing that an individual person would own something like that. So that's, that, that's, a, that's a point of contention and a point that became um, incomprehensible and insurmountable for us to deal with as time went on. So that's an interesting thing. But there were some places of cooperation. Probably the greatest place of cooperation was with the beaver trade. So by the time the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had been established, the, the beaver and other fur trade in in, in Europe had been completely exhausted. They had they had taken um, you know and and destroyed all of the wildlife and all of the fur. So they needed an outlet for fur because um, beaver hats were the rage of, with the aristocracy and the wealth. It was a, it was it was a uh, it was a um, source and a mark of social identity. And everyone from kings to the people in the court had these beaver hats and had had other things of fur. So this was an economic exchange between the between the natives and and the colony because um, 
this was the first time that we were introduced to steel tools and gunpowder for weaponry and so forth in exchange for that because the native people understood the wetlands and the the places where uh, beavers lived we went out and we did the hunting and, and, and the extraction of the beavers which on some levels was an egregious act for us because we understood and held all life is sacred so for us for the wanton idea of killing hundreds of thousands of these animals, but we were put in a position where we had to do these things because it became a, a way of survival in many ways. The beaver trade extracted about 500,000 um, pelts that were exported to, um, to, uh, to England and to Europe in the 17th century. It peaked in, uh, in the 1650s and about the time of King Philip's war, um, the beaver trade was exhausted. Um, with more than 100,000 colonies, uh, 1. 1. million acres of wetland and trees have been lost or destroyed in, in New England as a result of this. So even though there was this sort of cooperation, it was a destructive cooperation because it destroyed a lot of our uh, wetlands and also a lot of our trees. Which leads me to the next point, which was, you know, one of the other great things was the timber trade. So, you know, European forests had been leveled um, at the time of the, the colonies and then thereafter. And New England was plentiful. Not only was it plentiful in, 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 in timber, but we had created situations where we had thinned the forest, if you will, because this was the way that we hunted. And the highly prized hemlock and chestnut, maple, cedar, and oak trees were easy to go in and, 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 and farm out. So the Massachusetts Bay Colony, which depended a great deal on timber, depended on the natives to, to help them get that. So, you know, we would send wood, they would send wood back to England and what would come back would be good, you know, dresses and bureaus and, and, and things like that. And again, the natives were supplied with iron and metal tools and firearms, those things that we had not um, yet developed in our, in, in our, in our, our civilization yet. So let's talk about the differences. Um, um, and I think that's a great point by Willie Johns that we are here to enlighten, not accuse, but we have to look at this whole thing from the point of view of what we've come to realize these were two irreconcilable thought systems and there was no way that they would ever be compatible. It was just no way. One was going to win out over the other. Um, and unfortunately we know how that story went at least from that point of view. What I wanna do is show you a series of pictures which I think a picture tells a thousand words and it, it shows the differences of how we lived, how we were and how, how we acted that will show you clearly how these two thought systems could never come together. The first of those is our living conditions. Um, indigenous people had, again, as uh, both uh, Ferris and Brittany said, we lived in uh, wigwams and we twos and long houses and we lived in communities so we didn't have fences around our houses we didn't have square homes we didn't have rectangular plots um, most of the our living can our living places were round except for the long houses and so forth we lived mostly near water water was important to us because of the bathing and and because of the bounty that it held and our crops encircled our villages and encircled our town so you know there's there there may be miles and miles and miles of not just the three sisters but other crops that encircled us so we had this we had this interactive net Opposed to that was the way that the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony lived. So there was this separation. They put fences up. They did the egregious thing of bringing livestock, um, cows and pigs and other animals into their, into, into their living areas, which was egregious to us. So this picture certainly shows a difference which could never be reconciled. The next thing is um, the way that we dressed. So, you know, the Puritans were Puritans. You know, they had a certain way that they believed uh, they should be in this world based on the pure interpretation of the Bible. And they showed as little of their body as they possibly could. So native people, you know, we didn't have that sense of shame of the body. So, you know, the idea that, that, that you would see half naked people to us was not an egregious thing, but that certainly was egregious to, to the Puritans and to the people at Plymouth. The next way was this idea that women had this power, that women owned the fields, that women planted the crop, that we mound planted. We had these great mounds of the three sisters and other crops. And the Puritan way of doing things was, you know, um, using beasts of burden and plowing fields and, crop and planting one crop at a time in each field. 
And this was probably the most egregious, which was our idea of ceremony and our idea of spirituality and our idea of the, the natural world having um, everything having a spirit and the fact that we had many gods or we had many things that we prayed to, as opposed to the Puritan belief of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This was part of the thought system that would never be reconciled, but it certainly was the part of the thought system that um, many of the Puritans believed in their thought was, well, you know, we'll convert them to, Catholic, to, to, to Christianity, we'll convert them to the Bible, we'll make them Bible-loving people. Um, a quote that Coors often says is from Osamikin is, why should I trade my 37 gods for your one God? Now, the, 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 the thought there was that they would create these praying villages, which was championed by the Reverend John Eliot. And as you notice, you'll see all the, these praying villages which, which most of them encircled um, most of the places where the colonies had set up. And the idea was, we will put them in these praying villages and you can, lock, you, can, you can equate them to camps, if you will now, in which they are not allowed to practice their, their spirituality. They are not allowed to dress the way that they are. They're not allowed to speak their languages. We need to convert them over to our way of thinking. And even though we'll never think of them at the same level as we do, but maybe we can make them Christian and maybe we can make them follow the word. Uh, that was an experiment that didn't go too well. There's a there's an estimate that up to 40% of all indigenous people had been re relocated to these praying villages in 1675 at the time of King Philip's War. And one of the ideas that the, the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony had was that these villages and these natives would serve as a defense wall for the colony should something actually happen. Um, we know that that wasn't the outcome. We know that as King Philip's War broke out, there were three, there were probably more than three, out, but three out stated outcomes that could happen with Native people. They could side with the English, they could side with Medicon, they could become POWs, or they could be enslaved to the West Indies, or they could run away and hide. Um, and I'd like to have Ferris and Brittany have some commentary on um, what happened to the Massachusetts and the Nipmum people as a result of, of King Philip's War. Um, so Ferris, if you want to start with that. Sure. Um, I'd just like to say before I, we talk about um, what happened in the King Philip's War is um, the, the English set up these concentration camps um, to, to handle us, um, to isolate us even more. Um, and the first of these concentration camps, what we call them, um, was not um, during the King Philip War, but before the King Philip War, um, where um, at Ponkapog, um, which was an ancient village before it was a praying town, it was already a village. Um, they took the men from Ponkapog, and the Bay Colony did this, they took the men from Ponkapog and they isolated them on Long Island in the harbor um, for almost a year. Um, took them out of the villages, out of the village. And as a result, our women were left unprotected. Um, and and that was the first that I know of a uh, concentration camp here um, in this area. And that, and that and that was prior to the King Philip War, so it, it wasn't something new um, that happened. Um, but during the King Philip's War, um, it was the indigenous, uh, us, um, us and the, and the Nipmuc, which Brittany will talk about, the Massachusetts and the Nipmuc, that were taken out of praying villages and placed on Deer Island. Um, now Deer Island was pretty barren at this point. Um, there was nothing there. Um, the trees had been cut down and lumbered. So there was nothing there. There was no shelter. There was no, there was no resource to build a shelter. Um, and so the, the indigenous that lived in these praying villages were taken to Deer Island because the English feared that we were gonna rise up and side with King Philip. Uh, so they took us out and placed us, isolated us on the island where many of us died. And, and this is really, it's, it's a terrible thing that uh, the Bay Colony did uh, to the indigenous people. And these are the indigenous people that were converting to Christianity, um, these praying villages. And so we, we were the ones who, who were basically doing what we were forced to do, and we were still isolated. And, um, and, and the Nipmuc, they, they 
actually sponsor and, and coordinate a memorial uh, every year, um, a remembrance of our ancestors that um, had to endure that terrible thing. Um, so uh, I'd like to hand that to Brittany. Sure. Um, to kind of complete that thought, yes, um, Ferris is absolutely correct. We do have a ceremony. Unfortunately, with the pandemic this year, we were unable to do what we normally do. But the anniversary, if you will, of people being brought to Deer Island is actually at the end of this month um, in history. So that's just kind of something to keep on the mind. But yes, um, these outcomes that we're talking about, outcomes of this war, um, you know, as awful as they are, it, it is something interesting. It's something to think about a lot because you have these these praying Indians, if you will. I don't use that term Indian. I use it just because that's what was used in the time period. And um, these praying towns, these are people who, you know, they're not necessarily going to fit in with one or the other when it comes to are you native or you know are you christian and of course they're native on the inside but at this point for whatever reason you know whether they're fully believing it or doing it as a means of survival which is accounted for and is also true um these are people who are are doing what's being asked of them and doing what's what's being forced on them they've already been forcefully assimilated and at this point yeah a lot of people were taken um and killed or brought to these islands to then die because only a fraction of people survived. Um, you know, cause they're not, they're not actually either Puritan separatists, they're not Christian, you know, when it comes down to at the end of the day. So no matter what happened in those praying towns, the end result was, you know, most likely very negative. There were um, Nipmuc leaders that in hearings of King Philip's war and being you know in conversation with with Metacom with King Philip they absolutely did drop Christianity and join him so you have these different outcomes because it's not to say that every single praying Indian sided with the English although that also is something that happened as well so when you're thinking about um these outcomes it's a lot um it's a lot wiser to remember that political happenings in the past are just as complicated and multifaceted as they are today. Um, and just, I didn't speak on one of the other outcomes, which is being enslaved. And of course, you know, as, as we're all saying, as, especially as Cora, Cora's gonna speak about the land, you know, we all feel a strong connection one way or another in ourselves to the land. It makes no sense to enslave someone on their own land, you know? So these people are going to be shipped down to islands like the West Indies. And it, it may be hard to hear, but the North is usually considered um, better in terms of slavery. Um, but that's that's just not true at all for Native people. Um, Massachusetts and especially Rhode Island were huge hubs of enslaving Native people and shipping them elsewhere. So that's another outcome of this war. It's all very difficult to hear about, and um, it's certainly not pleasant for me to even talk about, but just in thinking about the war, you always want to consider how complicated war is, no matter what year it's happening in. Thank you. Thank you, Brittany. So I'm going to um, uh, um, go through these next few slides quick because I do want Cora and Brittany to have a chance to talk about um, the stuff in, in present day and some of the stuff you've already heard. So um, this concept and this idea, the one thing that we want to talk about, which, which I think we've, we, we've, we've brought home for you, is this idea of land and our understanding of belonging to the land versus owning the land. Um, and this lie or this idea that the, the, the land was that the land was available for settling. So that that even that in of itself is the idea that the people who are coming over to colonize this place had the right to take that land. Um, so that's something we could talk about ad nauseum. And we certainly could talk with Cora about Indian deeds and another webinar and so forth. But we really want to, to bring home the idea that we tried to bring them into our network of, of collaborative network of 
relationships. That didn't work. The concept of private ownership was incomprehensible to us. And as we started uh, being pushed further and further out of out of our land, out of the place to which we belong, that ultimately led to more and more uh, conflict. So I did want to make that point. The preludes to war are there. I do want to make two points about this, that, you know, there was the drum beating of war from ongoing encroachment from the beginning um, to the idea that even though Osimikin had an alliance at Plymouth, the Massachusetts and the Nipmuc people were always in, in, in conflict with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, that they did not necessarily subscribe to that, uh, to the, to the, to the pact that was made in Plymouth. And not only that, the Pocasset, the Namaskat, and the, and the Poconoke were not always um, in line with that. So this idea that there was this great peace is, is an illusion of history. And these other things ultimately led up to what became, became King Philip's War. And I'm sure most of you who are on this have heard a great deal about King Philip's War. The reason that I bring that in, and even though uh, King Philip and, and, and the, and the, um, the, the Poconoke, the, the um, Namaskat and the Pocasset were not Massachusetts necessarily, what happened because of this war um, ended uh, what we knew as life in all of New England, and it led way and gave permission once King Philip had been killed and many of our warriors had either been sold into slavery or, or died and so forth. It gave um, the colonists what they believed was the right to conquer the rest of what was New England ultimately um, the, 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 the beginnings of what became the United States of America. Um, this this quote here is important because it it, it 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 still they still called us heathens and that increased Mathard believed that the land this land um, that God had given to them so there was a sense of that they had the right to this land is still an egregious thought to most indigenous people. So if we look at where we are today and I know that's a jump so you know we're going from 1675 to the 21st century. We just want you all to know that in just like Black Lives Matter, Indigenous Lives Matter too. Um, we don't have any, you know, we, we, we're a multitude of ethnicities and the one that we vibrate the most to is Indigenous. If there's one thing that I want to, to call out from this besides the, the land and the mascot thing is that it's extraordinary to me that in a, con in a, in a state that claims first contact, that claims this concept of the first Thanksgiving. There is no process in this state to recognize the original owners of the land. So there is no process to do that. So yes, there are two quote unquote federally recognized tribes, but Massachusetts itself doesn't have a process for recognizing indigenous people. So with that, I'm going to have Cora go through her um, historic preservation on the land. So, Cora, it's, it's yours. Ta-da. Um, thank you for, for having me and, and for all of my fellow uh, panelists on this. You're going to be seeing pictures flashing by of before and afters. Um, unfortunately, with the history of our land, I first got into to researching uh, native deeds when I was doing genealogy. It wasn't just fun to find out that you had a, a native ancestor in Rehoboth or Freetown or Dartmouth or Westport or Cushionet. It was more interesting to find out what where they lived. And you could do that at, by tracing some of the church records or some of the town records, which were usually in a moldy basement. But um, that was how I first got interested in, in searching out the, the land deed. Um, oftentimes they'll say um, so-called Indian deeds, um, I, no hut shacks or shanties was another phrase that was usually when they stole land, um, when you would find that that would be the dead end of a deed. Um, some of the sites that have been flipping by um, in this um, of the my before and afters were from a place called Rocky Rocky Woods, um, and the more we looked, the more we found. And it was a really tragic experience to to realize that you couldn't save everything, um, and that the value that we place on land um, is something that you can't 
um, you can't put a price on that. There's no dollar amount. You can't say, you know, well, buy it from me for a million dollars because it's worth more than that. And but it's worth more than a, a dollar because a dollar is, you know, give me a couple of bushels of wampum um, and then we can sit down and talk. But most people don't look at land that way. Um, you know, how we value land. I've been uh, preserving land for about 20 years now. And how we value it um, for me has always been its native history because every, every person now that's sitting in their, their living room in their, their bedroom watching this webinar, you're on native land. And yet, do you even know the true tribe of that land? Do you know who to acknowledge um, for the, the original people? You know, unfortunately, for the 400 years that uh, the colonists have been here, um, there's kind of a failed experiment going on for, for the stewardship of this land. Um, you know, we can look at, you know, how I value land is, is for other wildlife, for the water on it, um, the, the trees and the crops and the ceremonial landscapes. Um, as has been pointed out earlier, we, we shifted during seasons. We shifted our villages and our camps um, at different moons during the year. And we went to ancient places and we traveled on ancient paths. And they're still there. I mean, they can be under, you know, pavement. Uh, the Bay Path is most of Route 6 um, in the southeast part of the, of the state. Um, and, you know, Route 44 um, goes from Plymouth to Providence. Uh, those were all traditional ancient paths. And so when, when looking for um, historic properties or to preserve them, um, usually they notify the, the federal tribes uh, under the section 106 process in the 11th hour, um, if they even make it to, to that point um, and tell us a little bit too late. Um, and it's, it's very difficult to preserve land when it's already under development. You have to attend a lot of meetings. You have to um, conservation, planning board, zoning. Each town is differently uh, different. Each state is different. Um, I worked with the uh, Narragansett tribe and the Rappahannock tribe in Virginia last year on the Phones Cliff. Um, the Phones Cliffs were, were one of the areas when John Smith came up the Rappahannock River that uh, there were arrows that were shot at him. And it was interesting, it, they're, they're still at risk um, from golf, a golf course development if they ever have any, you know, if anybody ever goes golfing again. Um, there's, you know, another person that wanted to put huge hotels there. And they're not thinking, they're thinking of the view, they're thinking of one generation making the almighty dollar, but at what cost? Um, oftentimes natives are perceived as when they, you know, we have to have artifacts found near us um, in archeology. span And when you bring in archeology, span you're still, it's still a new science for one. Two, it's a very invasive science because most of the artifacts um, that were gathered that gave the most uh, information uh, were from graves. Um, the Wampanucket in Lakeville um, near the White Banks is a perfect example where most, most books on New England woodland tribes use those artifacts as their examples, and yet they came from graves. Um, they're displayed in many museums. Um, and at least once, um, NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Repatriation Act, was in, invested. A lot of the remains from museums were returned. But were they returned to the land they walked? I don't believe so. And that's, that's one of the dishonorable things that have happened in the last 400 years. We also can look at the cost of development um, to these lands um, for, for lack of, you know, it's when, when I, I always get upset with the paved paradise put up a parking lot. Unfortunately, one of the, the key point places for uh, the Picasset people was a crossing point referred to by many as uh, Peace Haven on the Taunton River. It was recently sold to um, a car auction uh, company and they, they proposed 22,000 parking spaces 
for their temporary holding of cars for auctions. And this is an area also which has provided much of the, the knowledge to the archaeologists and, and um, academics uh, were, were dug at these, this location as well um, by, by weekend archaeologists and families. And they all went out in the 30s, 40s, and 50s and helped themselves and, and thought it was a great treasure hunt. And it was so disrespectful, um, and it still is. And, and yet people still are you know, in search of trying to interpret uh, us or, or ta document us out of existence. And in every town um, in, the, in Massachusetts, not just the South Coast, there's always the last native um, somewhere in their early history books. Um, they don't wanna believe that they, we were married in. Um, they didn't, they didn't wanna talk about the sexual assaults that occurred. Um, the ethnic cleansing, um, you know, whether they were sending us off to uh, the West Indies or if they were sending us to the next town over um, as an indentured servant. Um, there's a, a, you know, we were still here. And it's, it's always disheartening when we're, we're looking at the cost of development was is to the cost of the culture. Um, the, we, we can look at the fertilizers that some of these developments put, you know, put in on their grass. They oftentimes will clear cut an, an area, and they want to erase us, and they erase the landscape. Yet the damage that they do in their process, whether it's their septic systems um, that you know people are putting in all of their laundry soaps, uh, bath your hair shampoos, your hair dyes, um, your medications that you take every day, that's going into the ground. Um, and oftentimes during developments, um, they're trying to do wetland, follow wetland protection, and yet you're also going to be increasing the pollution um, because they'll do a wetland replication somewhere else uh, because they're filling in a wetland. Um, so there's so many different costs of, of developing uh, originally native lands that it, it is very difficult to, to, to preserve them. Um, I'm the president of the Fraven Akushina Land Trust um, down here in, in, south, in the South Coast. And we have about a thousand acres that covers about six different towns. Um, and we don't have, we have some trails, but a lot of it is in wetlands. A lot of it's landlocked and it's not for our benefit. It is for the benefit of the wildlife because without without the wetlands you have no life and we oftentimes forget that and uh, with my work with the Narragansett tribes a historic preservation office people are always surprised that we're willing to take wetlands but it's the understanding that you know thousands of years ago um, when there was a drought here that was where we hunted that is where so many of our ceremonial landscapes are are in areas that once had streams, that once had, um, you know, little kettle ponds. And unfortunately now many of those, you know, streams have been put in culverts um, and, and people wonder why bad things happen. And, you know, we have to return to taking care of the land. And the only way I, I believe is to really allow the tribes to be more part of the conversation of stewardship and to, to make it um, practical for them. I mean, the best thing I think that has happened in the last few years um, really was Standing Rock. Standing Rock empowered the amount of indigenous people uh, and youth to embrace the land and to, to understand the value of water and, and culture and one another, that it wasn't about my blood being thicker than yours or thinner than yours. It was about, we are all the same. And at the end of the day, the ancestors prayed for all of us. And they prayed for us to preserve the land, to preserve the energy of these places. Um, ceremonial landscapes, um, I don't wanna go too far over, um, are, are a very, beautiful thing, but they're also very vulnerable. And I really wish people would stop acting like it's a treasure hunt to find them and to name them. It's, we, we need to protect them, 
but at the same time when people do you know use it as a hobby it's very disrespectful i don't go running in and out of churches trying to see what people's statues look like um so i really wish sometimes that they'd stay out of the forest and and not try to dismember uh you know dismantle a a uh, stone effigy a mound um it's, you know, it's not yours for the taking. And uh, sometimes people will say, oh, I found this great item, you know, stone effigy on, on the ground. And, you know, and so I brought it home and you really shouldn't. It, it belongs to that land. It was a gift for your eyes for the moment, but it belongs to the land and not in your pocket. Um, I think that uh, land acknowledgement will, will have uh, Elizabeth's piece at the end. So I'll, I'll pass on going that. I know I covered a lot in a very short amount of time, but I really mm -hmm. want to um, thank everybody for, for this discussion, and I'd like to turn it over to Brittany. Great. So we're going to uh, if you all can hang on with us, um, Brittany, um, talk about this, and then we just have one last thing, and we'd like to take your questions. We know we're running late, but go ahead, Brittany. Sure, and um, thank you, Cora. A lot of what you are an expert on what you talk about really hits home for me. Um, but I'm here to talk about mascots. So with the disrespect that Cora is talking about, with the disrespect to our ancestors and the land, and sometimes our ancestors that should be in the land but are not, like this is a lot of disrespect. And so this is another facet in which Native people are trying to preserve our culture, ourselves, our well-being, um, in the face of very common, very popular disrespect. So in terms of mascots, I serve as my tribe as the Nipmucks anti-mascot representative. And I'm also part, as uh, mentioned earlier, I'm part of a statewide mascot coalition in Massachusetts. So when I volunteer to do these things, that means that I join other voices in panels or forums. Um, just, like that's how I met Ferris, I believe, <laughs> officially. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and we talk in these forums in, on the issue of native mascots and we illuminate how they are harmful from empirical and anecdotal evidence. Um, I've also been able to offer my insights to other people, uh, natives in other states who might be facing the same issues that we are um, or allies who have also undertaken the work because the work is um, it's a little deceitful. It's a lot harder than you might think. So this work is being done in many ways. Um, the issue of native mascots is multifaceted, so the solutions have to be as well. I believe a lot of this advocacy is in uplifting and supporting native voices that have already spoken on this issue because the opposition to native mascots has existed for decades. It's existed longer than I've been here. It's It's been existing since the mascots existed and the disrespect has been existing for over 400 years. So. Really, it's about the uplifting and the restating of things that have already been said. And some of this advocacy is exemplified in using empirical evidence um, and showing the harmful effects of native mascots in combination with what I mentioned, anecdotal evidence. Part of what's being done is on a state level. Uh, we hope to see state legislation passed to have a ban on all native mascots. In the meantime, work is being done on a local level. It's not favorable for someone like myself who may have back-to-back-to-back -to -back -to -back meetings um, in different towns. It's still a reality though. So in the meantime, there's gonna be advocacy on two different levels. And so this work is important because science does prove that native mascots are not educationally sound. Um, this is proven actually in work by uh, Dr. Le Laurel Davis Delano, um, Joseph Gohn, and Stephanie Freiberg. Um, this research, it specifies that there are direct effects of native mascots and some of them, not limited to, but some of them are a lowered self-esteem for native people, um, a less capacity to perceive future achievement related possible selves for native people, and also a lower community worth, a native person viewing their own community and having it that value be lower um, and an increase in negative feelings in general. And then there are indirect effects and they're also very condemning. So these indirect effects may be with non-native people. So native mascots and exposure to them, they're associated with negative thoughts and stereotypes about native people. People who support native mascots, they're more apt to hold stereotypical and prejudicial attitudes towards native people. And a few studies also suggest that native mascots increase discrimination towards native people. 
Now, I start with uh, the empirical evidence because a lot of this work is emotional labor. So a lot of the things that we've talked about today, whether it's our relationship with the land or if it's going to be um, talking about King Philip's War and talking about anything spanning all the decades, it's very emotional for me. And it's very emotional for, I believe, you know, I hesitate to speak for other people besides myself, but it's very emotional. It's very difficult. So I start with empirical evidence because it's, it's just much easier for me. For instance, um, if a school needs to decide on a new math curriculum, right? If research shows that a new method of teaching math is more effective than an old method, the new method will be adopted into the curriculum because that's just what science says you should do. Well, we do have research on native mascots and the method of using them. And so we know for a fact that it is not helpful in fostering an educational environment for students. So it should follow that the mascots then be taken down and removed. And again, that's why I start with empirical evidence, because it should be as simple as that. But anecdotal evidence is, you know, just as valid, in my humble opinion, as well, because it does come from a lived experience of a Native person. And that is very valid. Now, uh, just to kind of weave these issues together, because again, um, I wanted to kind of show how these Native mascots and the disrespect that they bring, it does go right along with the disrespect that Native people have been experiencing for years. Um, I personally, I have heard the argument uh, time and time again that there are more important issues to tackle than Native mascots. Um, I believe that the issue of Native mascots is intertwined with everything else that negatively affects Native people. And there is the old saying, knowledge is power. So if we are able to give the next generation um, a robust education and real knowledge of Native people, it can alleviate, it can alleviate some of the negative thoughts and actions that people take that lead to more immediately dangerous topics, topics that come from hate. And this hate is enabled to live through mascots. And some of these issues that are more widespread and more immediately dangerous are missing and murdered Indigenous women. Um, a recent thing that just happened, including the land, including the waters, was the Nova Scotia fishing dispute with the Mi'kmaq. Um, this comes from a place of ignorance and hate. And if we can get rid of part of that structure, you know, that's important. And that's where I find energy for it. And I would never say that the removal of Native mascots is the direct solution to issues like this, but I am saying that it is a part of it. And that's why I believe that it is an important thing for me to do. And uh, listeners today can also advocate. Um, there's something people can do that doesn't cost anything. It just costs a little bit of your time. And that's just to call up your local legislator and let them know that you are also for the ban of native mascots because there is um, a bill that we're hoping, you know, hoping will pass. So another way that people can be good allies, whether they're native or not, because native people can be allies to other native people as well, but also for people that are non-native, just check in, check in with communities that you're not a part of, um, check in with underrepresented populations. That's a very important thing to do because I have met many people who consider themselves allies, but they don't realize that they're speaking over the voices that they're trying to help. They don't realize in that moment that they are undermining the people they're trying to help. So checking in and finding out what the real problems are and seeing how you can be the best helper, that's that's probably the best way to be an ally. Um, and it, it impacts us all. I believe that if we can get rid of these barriers between communities, mascots being one of those barriers, um, it allows for us to connect and treat each other with respect and in some ways it's a bit idealistic, but I hope for that respect that we as native people through history first imagine we would have with being stewards of the land together and inviting people, allying ourselves with people and kind of having these thoughts of what we thought was normal at the time. I think that if we can get rid of these barriers that keep us separate to this day, we can slowly but hopefully get there. And I don't know what that means for communities once we get there, I can't say, but I do hope that it would lead for a higher quality of life for us right now and for the future generations as well. So Kadabadamish, thank you for listening. Thank you, Bernie, that was great. So we realize that we're, we're, we're over here at this point. Um, I would like to just 
finish this up with the uh, with the video that I spoke about. Hopefully, the people have stuck around for some questions. But here is a video from the Isabella Stewart Gartner Museum and Elizabeth Solomon talking about native lands. I'm speaking to you from native space. I am in native space and on the traditional lands of the Massachusetts tribe. My name is Elizabeth Solomon and I'm a member of the Massachusetts tribe at Ponkapog. If you visit or live on our lands, I ask that you treat them as something precious because they are. When indigenous communities in the United States gather together, they traditionally acknowledge and honor the ancestral holders of the land that they are meeting on. Many non-Native communities have now begun to incorporate this practice in public events. I'm speaking you, to you today because the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum has taken the important step of recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day and has started the process of building a meaningful relationship with the traditional holders of the land that they occupy. Here is where we laughed, loved, cried, made music, practiced our beliefs, shared both food and knowledge, and made both useful and sacred things. Here is where we raised our children and buried and honored our dead. Here is where English colonists began the conquest of the continent. Here is where a relationship with the colonists were built, destroyed, and built again. Some of these relationships were friendly and beneficial. Others were fraught with conflict, sadness, and loss. Here's where those who came to live among us saw land, resources, and sometimes people as commodities to be bought and sold. Here is where we maintained, sometimes in secret, our commitment to our own values and beliefs about the nature of the world, the land, resources, and people. Here is where we made alliances, intermarried, and made ongoing communities with people from other native groups and with those from other cultures. Here is where we continue to make our lives. Here is where we laugh, cry, love, make music, practice our beliefs, share food and knowledge, and make useful and sacred things. Here is where we raise our children and bury and honor our dead. But what do I mean by native space? You may be imagining the site of some former native settlements or perhaps parts of the environment that have, been felt, have not been developed but our connection to this place has not been affected despite thousands of years of both natural and man-made changes to our environment. We remember what was now, what is now dry land when it was water, and we remember what was water when it was dry land. We see that the landscapes are changing again and we remain. We are part of this place just as the land, the water, and the sky are part of this place. We are part of this place just as the wind and the rain, the plants and the animals are part of this place. Just as these elements are not separable from this place, neither are the Massachusetts people. We do not live in this place, we are of this place. I asked you earlier to treat the land as if it were precious. Please know that honoring the land means understanding our inseparable connectedness with everything else in the world. It acknowledges that all we do even the individual breaths that we take has an effect on everything else. So I honor all of the directions. I honor the land, the water. I honor the sky. I honor the sun and the moon and the stars. I honor the other living things that share this space with us. I honor the ancestors who came before me and those who will come after me. I honor everything that now lives with respect within this space. One of my requests of you is that as you go through the world, that you think about and acknowledge that you are likely in indigenous space and that there are people who belong to that place. Be mindful of how you interact with that space and its people. May all that we do in native spaces both honor the land and prepare the way for all of those to come. Thank you, um, John. Thank everyone for listening. Um, I think that was a wonderful way of wrapping it up. Um, we did go quite over quite a bit. Um, so I'll take it back to you from here. Lance, thank you so very much. Thank you, Cora. Thank you, Ferries. Thank you, everybody who's made this such a wonderful, wonderful Brittany. 
such a wonderful evening. Um, I'd like to uh, end by looking at the questions that we've got rather briefly. And uh, Gail Kemmer asks, do, are there any books to recommend? I just want to say that I will be sending out a list of supplemental reading to everybody who's participated tonight. So there will be lots of ways to think about how we go from here. How many people were sent into slavery from New England? Is there any kind of an estimate of that? Native Americans. My, my, <clears throat> I guess on that, it seems like a lot of people at the ends of the wars, the survivors were sent into slavery, into uh, the uh, islands, uh, and, and probably the number is several hundred, I'm going to gather. Uh, many of the women and children were retained here as servants or slaves, um, but the men were, were, and men and boys were usually so sold who hadn't been killed. Um, the, uh, Rose notes that the questions before and after were very powerful. I, I wanted to add on just yes, quickly please. to that um, question about slavery, because I don't want people to um, have a misunderstanding. People were being enslaved far before King Philip's War, far yes. before the Pequot War. Um, and one thing that is somewhat difficult to wrap your head around at first is that people were being taken, Native people were being taken before Plymouth Colony. Yes. And so one person that I often use as an example is Tisquantum or Squanto yes. or whatever you want to think of him, but his name is Tisquantum. He was actually, um, you know, he was drawn to a ship under the guise of, of trade. And he was on that ship with roughly 30 other Native people that were brought over to Europe. And he's one of the only few people yeah, I, okay. I know of two specific people who actually made their way back to their home across the ocean. And he stayed in England for about five years. And people would, English people or European people would have Native people in cages on display as animals. And once that novelty wore off, then they were used as guides back in the new world, if you will. So slavery came in many different forms and so did captivity. And this was going on for so long. And then of course, as the wars happened, you would have you know, m more of a large group of people being enslaved because of the war. But like I said, he was on that ship with 30 other natives and this was before Plymouth Colony. About So if that helps you kind of imagine what the landscape of slavery was like, you know, I hope that helps. Uh, it does help. I mean, I, you're absolutely right. This, the whole business of captivity and slavery much perceives the beginnings, even the beginnings of colonization. Uh, Cindy Corey asked, how many participants were in this presentation? We were, uh, the top, total number was about 165 at one point. We're down to 100, 130 or so, uh, but very active group of people and uh, be very happy to send around the supplemental reading list and also a uh, evaluation of, of how this pre presentation was received by everybody and a, a pricey of what we'll be doing, the partnership we'll be doing uh, later on this fall even and then in the spring as we spring up into our reading groups, which will be carried live through Zoom so that everybody can participate as a, a real life participant in discussions of books and, and articles and things like that, that we will have available to people to download and read. Um, first member, uh, let's see. Um, how are any, uh, are there any homes being built now that you would consider to be in the sense uh, ecologically appropriate? How do you how do you feel about current construction? What would what would you like to see differently? Various. Anyone want to take that on? Can you unmute Various? He has to unmute himself. Various, can you unmute yourself? Unmute yourself. There he goes. So, what was the question? Would we like to see homes built? The, the question was current construction. Is is there a way that you would see as current construction to be uh, con consistent with the the beliefs of uh, being part of nature in a way that we aren't now? Does, does current construction 
constrict us or entice us into nature? Well, um, from what I've seen locally here, um, there is no regard given to nature at all. Yeah. People go into a place, they cut the trees down. These trees are lives. They have spirit and energy. There are um, beings, there are animals that count on these trees and the forest and the area. Um, none of that is considered. I can tell you on our tribal land, um, just adjacent to our tribal land in Stoughton, uh, Stoughton just cleared probably about five acres because they want to make a camp um, cut on all the trees. And so there's no, the way things are constructed today, uh, there is no consideration given to nature, uh, only what federal law, state law mandates for wetlands and um, water sources and things like that, but not for the animals that live there, uh, not for the trees. Trees are seen as a resource, not as a, as a life force. And so I think it's the way of thinking, this colonial way of thinking of being separate from your own environment that is, is really hazardous and it's damages them all. So um, we could, um, when we construct things, have a better understanding and uh, more empathy and a better connection to nature, we could. We have the technology, but it's just, it's, it's about money. It's yes, about yes. just going there and cut it down. So uh, I think a yeah. lot needs to be done for that. And um, I think that... Uh, Indigenous people can definitely help. Yeah. There, there are four questions that I want to link together. Uh, one is uh, a th thank you for everyone who's participated in this and the fabulous job that you did in putting this presentation together. And the corollary question is, can any pieces of it be downloaded for use? And what, what would be the right way to give a proper uh, appreciation and thank you to the people who developed it? Um, so the similar questions are, can we get a copy of the program in the slides? Is the vi video of Elizabeth Solomon publicly available? And uh, thank you for the list of books, I'll appreciate it. All of those are sort of a link of what we'll be sending out as supplementary information. So Lance, if you want to say anything about the reuse of these uh, pieces of this uh, by anyone who would like to uh, give us the uh, quote for it. Sure. I think that, I mean, obviously, initially, this is being recorded so that anyone at some point can can access the recording from from the partnership. Um, let us look into how we what we would want to do in terms of making the actual presentation downloadable and how we would do that. So we'll get back to you, John, sure. on that. You can post that to the other thing. The Great. video with Elizabeth Solomon is actually a long video. We only showed you the beginning part of that. And that is available. That is a YouTube video. If you Google, if you YouTube the um, uh, Eliz uh, Isabel Stewart Gardner Museum's Indigenous Day tribute, that video will come up. And there's some interesting things on the end of that about what's happening in Indigenous space. So you can take a look at that. And I'm not sure, was there one more question there that, oh, and then the, there will be a, we have created a very long list of um, resources, not only books, but also websites and so forth that you can look at, some books that give um, a view of things that happen from, that give a more kinder, gentler view of indigenous people and what we went through. So those will all be available at one time. It was a long list. So um, the, the um, um, John and, and James decided it would be better to post it so that you could take a look at that and instead yep. of in chat so you could download that for yourself. But let me get back um, after I talk to the panelists about how we would make the presentation available in terms of um, acknowledgements and so forth. We certainly want to make sure that it's shared. I think that one thing that we probably want to do is make sure that um, all of, we, we've done a pretty good job of notating some of the slides, but I would like the slides to notate to be notated so that you would have a narrative in the event that you were using that for other education, specifically around some of the stuff that Brittany talked about and the stuff when we talk about you know how we were as nations so absolutely we'll get back to you john on that good uh Brittany wants to take on a question about what's the sensitive and appropriate way to talk about native americans or tribal people or indigenous people or what what language should we be thinking of and thinking in I don't always love to take questions and I'm not comfortable speaking for other people, but this one I feel 100% confident Absolutely. In. Use the person's tribe. Use the person's yeah. tribal affiliation if you know. So, for instance, everyone here now knows that I'm Nipmuc, so if you need to refer to me, 
you know, and you want to say something about how I'm a native person, use Nipmuc. Um, and if people don't understand or don't know the tribe, then you get into something that's a little bit more interesting because I like to use the words indigenous and native. However, if you're speaking to a, an audience that's more global, those words can apply to all of the lands everywhere you know you can be native to wherever and indigenous to whatever so that's when i incorporate the word america but i do struggle with it because i often find myself in educational environments and i make a point of saying that this land is not known as america for we were here before it was called america america is the name of some italian guy you know so (laughs) that's why i i like to say start with a person's tribe as best as you can if you don't know the tribe or if you're trying to speak in groups i often will try to use the same type of thought that my ancestors did and use the land as a describer so for instance instance, if I had to clump um, me and Ferris and Cora together, I would say, you know, maybe northern, northeastern woodland or eastern woodland people. But because we've talked about so many differences, it would be better to refer to us by our tribes. The ones that I don't love so much are the words Indian. There's so many complications behind that word. And it also makes it very difficult for people who are from India. So, for instance, one thing I come up with a lot with schools, maybe a school has a mascot called the Indians. That gets confusing for indigenous people and it gets confusing for people who are from India. So it brings up a lot of modern issues, but it's also just historically inaccurate. Um, and that's what I feel comfortable saying. And if anyone else wants to join in as well, but I feel really confident with that yeah. answer. <laughs> totally that's back how I would be help. comfortable with. Yeah. Yeah. The other point that I would make from, from my standpoint is I, I particularly don't like the word tribe. I prefer the word nation or just yeah. uh, or the Massachusetts or the Pocasset because tribe, in my opinion, was a word that was was put on us to denote a certain sub beingness about it. So, so if you notice that I we we in the Namaskit call ourselves to the Namaskit nation. I know that tribe and tribal is, is so pervasive in the lexicon but it actually, in my opinion, it is not a word that I prefer to use. It's similar to me. It's like the word Indian. It's not a word that I that I, I like the word indigenous, First Nations, you know, original people. Or I like to just say, you know, if I were talking about Brittany, I'd say Brittany is a Nipmuc. I'd say Ferris is a Massachusetts. Cora is a is is a, a Pocasset. But I wouldn't add the word tribe to it. I just don't like the word. Yeah. Um, I'd like to kind of wrap it up um, with a amalgamating two questions that have to do with, would you consider creating a panel of tribal members to discuss relations for future growth and land recovery for the nations? And how are, how should cities and towns think about, in Massachusetts, think about their seals? Both of these are very pregnant questions. Um, yes, the answer is we will continue. This is the start of a dialogue rather than the middle or the end of a dialogue. And yes, stay with us and the partnership will sponsor further discussion groups and these can be issues that will come up and will come up and gladly gladly come up <sighs> thank you so very much for bringing this to us thank you we appreciate that we, we thank you for having the courage to let us speak in this way this is not an easy conversation to have with people who became the oppressor if you will or became the conquering nation but we have to face these things and we have to find a place for peace because we can't progress and become better human beings together if we can't recognize these things and move on. Again, we're here to educate, not to accuse. Um, you know, the, the accusations have already been done. So we thank you very much and we look forward to um, to um, relationships with uh, with the partnership and doing some more things with you. So thank you very much on behalf of- Thank you of- very much. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.